Today we're studying from God's Word in 1 Peter chapter 3, the first seven verses. And when we're studying this part of 1 Peter, let's keep in mind again that we're uh, in a section where Peter's talking about living under the system. There are political systems and work systems and family systems. And in each of those situations, people who became Christians had questions, how do I live? Do I try to just totally get rid of the existing system? And the answer to that was, no, you don't just wipe out all systems. There's going to be some kind of political and work and family system that you have to live within. And also, how do I deal with the people who have positions of authority or prominence in that system? Especially with pagans. What do I do when the ruler of the political system is a pagan? What do I do when the boss is a pagan? And today, what do I do if my husband is a pagan? How do I deal with an unbelieving husband, a husband who is disobedient to the gospel and to the word of God? How do I deal with that? That's uh, the bigger context that our passage comes in. How do I live under the system in particular? How do I live if the person that I've got to deal with in that system is not a follower of Jesus Christ? And here it's getting literally close to home. It's living family life when someone is not a Christian. Now, let's understand the situation there too, because the Bible doesn't take for granted that Christian people are just going to go off and marry people who aren't. People who are disobedient to the gospel and reject the gospel of Christ. This is written in a missionary situation where people were coming to Christ in a society that had really not known anything of the gospel. And so sometimes you had one spouse putting their faith in the Lord Jesus and the other one not. And so how, if you're the one who does trust Jesus, do you live with the one who doesn't? How do you conduct yourself? But overall, the Bible says, now, if you're a Christian um, and, and you're in a community of Christians, then you shouldn't marry somebody unless they are in the Lord as well. So the overall instruction is find somebody whose faith um, matches yours, um, who loves Jesus as you do, who wants to bring up children in the faith as you do. But... The Bible dresses us often in the situation we're in, not the one we're supposed to be in. And, of course, in that missionary situation, when both had started out as unbelievers and then one comes to faith, uh, that's, a, that's the kind of situation that you have to be ready to deal with. And so the Bible uh, addresses women and then also briefly husbands in that situation. It would be more common, probably, for the husband to be unconverted uh, and not the wife, because partially, if a husband was converted, very often in that culture, a wife would come along with him. Also, um, in, in 1 Peter, he doesn't speak with quite the same balance that the Apostle Paul does. When Paul talks to slaves, he also talks to the owners. When Paul talks to um, children, he also talks to the parents. In this case, Peter does talk to both the wife and the husband. But there's a reason why Peter doesn't talk with quite as much balance when he's writing to these situations. There weren't many rulers in his audience, so you were talking to their subjects mostly. There weren't many slave owners in his audience, but there was a pile of slaves, and there probably weren't very many men who were converted without their wives also coming along with them, but in this case he does speak to both. So let's hear what Peter has to say. It's very important to understand the context in which things are said, and that's why I've mentioned these things before reading the passage. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of long ago who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters 
if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. This is one of those allergy passages, a passage that people in our time will go allergic to the moment they hear it in some circumstances. And so right away, if your reaction is somewhat allergic, if you're already breaking out into hives at what Peter had to say, then uh, we should just put the two alternatives side by side just straight up. First, he says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. So we'll look at what he says to husbands in a moment, but now the overall passage compared to um, the contemporary alternative. Is the alternative better than the Bible? Marriage can be same sex. Um, Peter addresses husbands and wives. Um, contemporary life says, hey, it could be either one. Uh, it doesn't matter if you marry someone of your own sex or not. Um, and even if you marry someone of the opposite sex, you're pretty much interchangeable. Um, you're pretty much identical. Um, act like you're interchangeable. Don't try to win over a faithless spouse. Who would want to do that? We're very tolerant. Um, you wouldn't want to make it your objective to help someone believe in Jesus just because you do. Focus on clothes and cosmetics. Image is everything. Women be pushy, men be wimpy. The wife is the stronger partner. That, that would be maybe a bit of a caricature, but a, but a summary of what contemporary people tend to think in Western society. And so if, if you're really um, immersed or absorbed or saturated with this kind of thinking, then what Peter says will maybe hit you very hard and you won't like it. It's important, nonetheless, to just allow the possibility that God knows better than we do. Just maybe God knows better than we do. Now, we have to be careful to, not to assume that everything we ever grew up with what that was said about women and, and men and their relationship came straight from the throne of God. You know, there's a lot of cultural assumptions older cultural assumptions that might have been incorrect. Uh, that some of them are incorrect as well as some of the new ones. So we have to allow for the possibility nonetheless that when we're listening to the Word of God and it hits us wrong, we're the ones who might need to change more than tweaking and adapting what God's Word says. When we think about what Peter says to wives, it's basically giving the message that the wife who's married to a non-Christian husband in particular is to attract rather than to push or browbeat or kind of nag him into becoming a Christian. And there's three things uh, that summarize Peter's message. Win without words, dress for success, respect as royalty. When I think about winning without words, that doesn't mean that if you are a woman who is married to an unbelieving man, that you would never talk to him about Jesus or about the gospel. Again, within context. We have read the first part of 1 Peter 3. If you move on just a little further to verse 16, it says, Always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Apologetics. Be ready to explain the gospel. Be ready to give an answer when somebody asks, and always be doing that with gentleness and respect. Now, if that's true of your relationships in general, how much more true it ought to be when you're dealing with the person who is closest to you. You don't keep your faith a total secret, and you say, well, I've been converted, but the Bible says to win him over without words, so I'm not going to make a single peep about the fact that I now believe in Jesus or follow him. Uh, be ready to answer any time and explain why you believe in Jesus and who he is and why you love him and the difference that he's making in your life. But sometimes a husband does not obey the gospel. He does not receive Christ as Savior. What then? Well, once you've stated what you believe and why, then says Peter, let your life do the talking. Let your life do the talking. Go back to Proverbs for a moment. What does the book of Proverbs say about a nagging wife? It's not a pretty picture. Um, you know, at one point it says like she's a drip, 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 drip. And if you're going to try to nag your husband into the kingdom of God with drip, 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 
It makes him want to be somewhere else. It says better to live on the corner of the roof than with a wife like that. Oh, let me rephrase. It's better to live out in the desert than to live with a wife like that. So if you don't want your husband to say, oh, drip, 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 I wish I was in the roof. No, I think I wish I was out in the Mojave Desert. Um, then don't try to win him to Christ by every day waking up and say, honey, have you believed yet? Has Jesus invaded your heart and taken over your life? You know, and whatever else your um, nagging technique might be, Peter is saying, no, if, if he won't listen when you've presented him the gospel, then let your life and your manner win him over. And this is excellent guidance, not just for a wife dealing with an unbelieving husband, but for a lot of relationships that we're in. If you have an unbelieving friend, be ready anytime to say why you believe and how they could become a Christian. But sometimes they're not ready to listen. Stay friends. Build bonds of respect and love and show by your life that you've got something that they may be missing out on. That can be the case even with bringing up children. Now, we're called to bring up our children in the instruction of the Lord, and so instruct your children, and your relationship as you're bringing them up is to teach them the ways of God, read them the Bible every day, have Bible reading and family time together, but realize that sometimes the timing is going to be different, and, and they may not believe right away. They may resist the gospel, and it's going to have to be to a considerable degree, especially as they get older, your life and your love and your manner, rather than the words that you conveyed. The words will sink in uh, if the life keeps winning them over. And so, um, win without words. And let me just emphasize again that he says, win them over. When, when Peter says, now be submissive to your husband and let your life do the talking, he's not saying, now be the nice little wifey, the doormat, who just um, is powerless in the relationship and is a nobody. He's saying, no, I want... I want a little bit of strategic submission here because you're trying to do a, the influencing. You're trying to change him, actually. You are. I mean, you've got to be a little careful about trying to change your spouse. And that's one of the reasons you don't, um, if you have a choice in the matter, you don't marry ahead of time someone you know to be a non-Christian and say, I'll change him afterward. That, that's just disobeying God. But having said all that, if you're in this relationship, the submission that Peter is describing here is not just the doormat version of submission. It's saying, I've got a goal for my husband because I love him. I want him to live forever. I want him to belong to Jesus and enjoy all the benefits of belonging to Jesus. And so I'm going to put up with some stuff. I'm going to live under the situation that we're in. And I'm going to let my life do the talking and win him over. And so that is still... Uh, anytime, all through this passage, Peter's saying, now, you who are living under government, you may feel like a victim. You are actually the agents of God's change and his kingdom in this world. You're living as a slave under a boss or a master, and you feel like nobody? No, you're not a victim. You're an agent. You are here to be God's ambassadors in this world, whatever your social position is. You're a wife con um, considered subservient to husbands in that society? Well, you're still an agent and you're trying to win. You're trying to win him over. Only you're doing it without words, without a bunch of, of nagging. The, the next thing that Peter brings out is uh, the nature of true, true beauty or of dressing for success. And he's saying don't measure success by how you look. Now, that's not to say that how you look doesn't matter at all or that it's bad to be beautiful. If you read the Bible, you find that Sarah, the wife of Abraham, was beautiful. That Rebecca, the wife of Isaac, was beautiful. That Rachel, the wife of Jacob, was beautiful. That Abigail, a person of great intelligence, was also very beautiful with a husband whose name literally meant fool. You know, and at one point, she just had to step in because fool was wrecking everything. Nabal was going to get everybody in the whole household killed by being such a dunce. And so Abigail steps in and says, yeah, my husband's name is fool and he lives up to it or down to it. And I've got to intervene here and save everybody's bacon. You know, so submission does not mean let the moron wreck everything and get you all killed. But she was a very beautiful as well as a very wise woman, Queen Esther, um, 
rose to that position because of her extraordinary beauty, um, and yet she didn't say, well, I'm a nice, um, cute thing to be looked at. Um, she saved the people of God when the chips were down. But all that's to say that being beautiful is a good thing if you happen to have beauty. But keep in mind what Proverbs says, um, charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Like a gold ring and a pig snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. So beauty, it's nice if you got it. It's worth something. Um, now, let's think about what real beauty is. He says that's the beauty of the inner person, of a, of a gentle and quiet spirit which God cares about a lot. It's of great worth in God's sight. And when you hear that, that means that we've got to readjust because, again, the message of our culture is very, very different. And when we dress for success in our culture, then some women will dress in a manner that they have two goals. One is to get men to look and to lust, and the other is to get women to envy. Is that stating it too strongly? I'm trying to attract the eyes of men and make them want me, and want me in sometimes the lowest way. And I would like the ladies to say, ooh, I wish I was her. I wish I looked like that. I wish I was dressed like that. I wish I had jewelry like that. Um, so this idea in Peter of saying, now, what do, you, what do you consider to be really beautiful? And then what kind of cosmetics and dress are you aiming for? Outer beauty matters less than inner beauty in God's sight. It's that simple. And so, I mean, a, a, just a blunt question for um, ladies and girls is this. Um, do I spend more time in front of a mirror um, working on um, my makeup and my look for the day than I do with the Lord? You know, just check your watch sometime, you know. Check your watch. Say, how much time do I spend on dressing up, looking good and all that versus how much time I spend with the Lord? If you're spending a long time on your look and two minutes or less on your Bible reading and prayer, you may want to tweak that a little bit, or a lot. And again, I don't want to, you know, I'm a guy, I don't, I don't always get the whole makeup thing. I figure when people look good, they look good, <laughs> you know, even without all the makeup. But hey, you have at it if you want a little bit of that. But, but that's not, um, you know, that's not real beauty. And, and different people are going to have a little different taste in that, but be very cautious that your definition of beauty and the amount of time and effort you invest into beauty, are you trying to develop the beauty of the inner self that Peter says is of great worth in God's sight? Well, there's a, there's a couple of kinds of immodesty. Peter talks this way, and the Apostle Paul also writes in 1 Timothy 2, he says, I want women to dress modestly, not with decent, or Dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. So there's a couple kinds of immodesty. One is the, the kind where you're trying to lure them with um, sexual beauty and let more show than you should. The other is um, showing off your wealth. Uh, I shop, therefore I am. You know, their little twist on Descartes. Uh, you know, I... I can buy this stuff, I can wear this stuff, ain't I wonderful? You know, your, your jewelry and your apparel are how you show your um, affluence and your wealth and how your high society and people who wear, you know, the cheaper stuff from Walmart, no, bleh, you know, what are they? So, you know, that, there's two kinds of immodesty. One is more the, the sexual immodesty, but the other one is equally problematic, and that is trying to make money and style the measure. Uh, you know, and you see it, uh, you know, some of you who were homeschooled, some of you grew up in school, and you know how kids who didn't wear the latest and most expensive styles are looked at how kids who had only the $40 knockoff brand instead of the $200 shoes, um, you know, they just don't measure up. So, again, dress for success in God's sight. And then, um, to respect as royalty. Again, let, let me just say, when, when it comes to this beauty of the inner self, it's not just talking to women. It, it says in, 
uh, verse 16 again, that when you're giving an account to other people of your faith, you do it with gentleness and respect. And there it's not talking just to women relating to their husband. It's talking to everybody. When it says to be submissive, the Bible doesn't actually just talk to women about that. Uh, when it talks in Ephesians 5 and says, wives, submit to your husbands, it first says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And the other is just a continuation of that thought. The word submit doesn't actually even appear in the instruction to women. Um, it's a continuation of the thought. Now, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to your husbands as to the Lord. If you read in 1 Peter, it says, wives, be submissive to your husbands. And just a little bit later, it says, all of you, clothe yourselves. Again, dress for success, kind of combining the thoughts. All of you, clothe yourselves with what? Humility toward one another. Clothe yourselves with humility. Dress yourself up in humility, and then you'll be really looking good in God's sight. And then there is nonetheless still this sense that a woman um, is to show great respect for her husband, to be submissive to him. And it says this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God uh, used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. Now, there again, you have to take what it says and also remember the wider context. If you read the actual story of Sarah and Abraham, she referred to Abraham as her master, and she also told Abraham what to do <laughs> a number of times, maybe a couple times when she shouldn't have. But nonetheless, she was not exactly, hey, Abe, what's happening today? Your wish is my command. Uh, she would... She would get ideas of what ought to be done, and she would tell them to Abraham, and the man would usually do what she said. So there is this mutual influence going on between them, and yet there's not a competition. She knew Abraham. She knew her husband. She knew that he was great in God's eyes, and he was pretty great in her eyes too. So if you're married to a man, even a pagan man, you're being told here by Peter to honor him and to live under him. But if you're married to a godly Christian man, how much better how, and how much easier to have that attitude of respect and to, um, regard him as someone that God has placed in your life to bless you. One of the things it doesn't say here is that you submit to every man on the whole planet because he's a man and you're a woman. Okay, that, that's one of the things that's not said. Another is um, simply that submission to him, as I've already said, you're in the business, actually, if you're married to the unbelieving man, of winning him over. So you're actually seeking to influence him. At the same time, you're showing respect and honoring him. So all those things are going on at the same time. The short of it is, be seeking what's good for your husband. And above all, that he be saved and know the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that he flourish as a man in who he ought to be, not that he just be your little lackey under your thumb following your orders. And then Peter goes on to talk to husbands. Um, wives are to attract in the right way. And husbands, if you had to summarize it, are to be attentive. And Peter says to dwell with them in knowledge, to protect them as the weaker partner, to honor them as eternal equals, and to listen to them like God listens. He says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Where it says, um, husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives, that's a little bit of over-translating, actually. Um, literally, it just says, husbands, dwell with your wife in knowledge. And the emphasis actually is the, on the dwell, and then in knowledge is kind of what qualifies that. And so I, I think there's actually something very important in husbands dwell or live with your wife. Because it is possible to be a husband who is largely an absentee husband. Uh, maybe you're gone way too much, and maybe you're there and you're still gone. You just don't listen. You don't pay attention. When you're home, you're watching the tube all day, or, or not all day, hopefully you do a little work once in a while. <laughs> but when you are in the home, you know, are you actually paying attention? 
Or are you just up to something else? So dwell, be there for her, and then dwell in knowledge. Now, what does that mean? The, the translation that we're using, the NIV, says be considerate as you live with your wife, and that's certainly very important. You consider her. Your knowledge is of her. You're paying attention to her so that you understand her better and you know her better. But again, it's a little over-translating to say be considerate because it just means dwell in knowledge. And it probably means knowledge of what God wants as well as of what, who she is and what, and what she wants. Pay attention to God's guidance for how to be the right kind of husband. And then pay attention to her and who she is and how she can best flourish because you're not going to be uh, the kind of husband that you ought to be if you're not paying attention to who she is. Um, in short, don't be a dunce, you know, and don't be gone all the time, whether checked out physically and never there or checked out mentally and never paying attention. Dwell with knowledge. Study the Bible with her. That, I mean, that'll kill two birds with one stone because if you're doing devotions together as a couple or as a family, then you're learning God's will, and at the same time as you're talking together, you're learning more and more about each other. And your marriage is going to flourish the better you know God and the better you know each other. The second thing is uh, protect the weaker partner. Now this, again, is one of those things that some folks might go allergic to. And uh, a week or two ago, there was a lot of publicity because, you know what? A student, a female student at a university did the kickoff in a football game <laughs> for a team that hasn't won a game all year. And this was news that all is equal. Now, let me just ask you for a moment. Um, if it comes to a tussle in a football game, is your bet on the kicker or the middle linebacker? Okay, the middle linebacker is, the, uh, is a little stronger than the kicker. The kicker is the weakest position on the team in terms of physical strength. And yet, you don't see any female kickers except for that one kickoff for a winless team. Because, let's face it, physically... Almost always men are stronger. You watch these movies with the ninja mamas, you know, the 110 pounders that are beating up on the 250 pound men. In real life, my bet's on the 250 pounder, not on the ninja mamas. But hey, we all have our fantasies. I watch spy movies. I'm no super spy either, you know. If I was out on the football field, I'd get killed too. But when Peter's talking, he's not saying, now she's the weaker partner because she's dumber than you are. Your intellect is superior. He's not saying that She's the weaker partner because you're worth more than she is. If something is more fragile than something else, does that mean that the one is worth more than the other? If that's the case, I have a plastic cup that I would love to exchange for one of those uh, vases from the Ming Dynasty. <laughs> you know, they're worth a gazillion dollars. That plastic cup, you can get you know, probably a dozen of those for five bucks. Just because something is a bit more fragile does not mean that the Ming vase is not worth as much as my tougher plastic cup. Well, there's, um, there's a lot to consider here. I'm not going to try to get into all of it um, because I'm not that much more knowledgeable than anybody else. But the Bible does say, now if you're a man, keep track of the fact that she's the weaker vessel, the weaker partner. And especially in a physical sense. There are situations where a woman has a very high position, even in society, where she may hold a big position in a corporation, and at home her husband beats on her, because he can. Okay, in almost every situation, a husband can beat up his wife and ruin her if he wants to. Use your strength to protect her, not to ruin her life. And it, it's also true, maybe to a degree, although that's more of a generalization, that when you're dealing with feelings, sometimes women are more vulnerable. It's a generalization, but it's not true in every case, that when faced with hard circumstances, men get mad and women get sad. Now, if the shoe doesn't fit, then just scratch that out. But if you study psychology and sociology, you'll find that as a generalization, uh, women's reaction to adverse circumstances is often to be more depressed and men, more aggressive. Women get sad, men get mad. If that doesn't help, then ditch it. But if it kind of fits um, your experience and your situation, then observe that. And, and, and if that's so, it might be another case in which in 
where men might be the stronger, if you want to call it stronger, and women um, the weaker because the man can do a little more emotional bullying and, and she'll get sad quicker. So um, keep those kinds of things in mind um, when you're thinking about, as a husband, how you're going to do what's good and right and protect your wife. Now, in fairness, it should be observed that women live longer than men. So evidently, they're either, well, I won't, yeah. Either they're tougher or men are easier to live with. No, there, there may be other options out there. <laughs> but, you know, when we joke about these things, but it's just a fact that on average, women outlive men. And whether that's due to their um, stronger constitution in some ways, even though their ability to lift weights might be a little less, or because we men are so easy to live with that, you know, they just go on and on. Um, you, you, you take your pick of what you think is correct there. But the, the overall role, if you're a man, you ought to be standing up for your woman and defending her and protecting her rather than using your own strength against her. The Apostle Paul, when he writes in Ephesians 5, says, what kind of, I mean, a man would look after his own body. He says, you and your wife are one. What kind of moron doesn't feed and care for his own body? What kind of idiot wouldn't take care of his wife? And then Peter goes on to say, now, respect her, honor her as your eternal equal. Because she is. She's an heir with you of the gracious gift of life. God gives her the gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is a person who, if you could see her Someday, if you could see her now as she will be someday, you'd probably be tempted to fall down and worship her because she is going to be seated on one of those thrones with Christ and enthroned with him. She's going to be a princess or queen in God's kingdom. And what are you treating her like? Are you treating her like royalty? Is she your queen? Honor her as your eternal equal because she is. God created her in his image just as much as you. Christ died for her and shed his blood for her just as much as he died for any man. The Holy Spirit indwells her just as much as he indwells any man. And so because you're eternally equal and you have this tremendous destiny, both of you, start treating each other as royalty right now. And you're not even going to get into tussles over who has to submit to whom. If you take Paul's language from Ephesians 5, he uses the language of submission for the wife and the language of sacrifice for the husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So a husband, if he wants to be the leader in the home and say, I've got to take the lead and she's got to be submissive, then you take the lead in sacrificing, in laying down your life, in paying whatever price it takes to do what's best for your wife. And if you do that, she might find you kind of easy to submit to. Okay? And if you have fights, I've mentioned before how to have a good, fair Christian fight. Um, you've, you've heard it before. I'll just remind you again that if you get into a fight as husband and wife, then the fight goes something like this. Okay, the Bible tells me to submit to you, so we're going to do it your way. No, no. The Bible says that I'm to sacrifice for you, honey, so we're going to do it your way. No, it says I submit to you, so we do it your way. No, I sacrifice for you, and I'm the head of this relationship, and that's how it's going to be. You know, that, that, that is a good Christian fight. <laughs> and if your fight is just, I'm a, I want to have my own way, and I'm going to try to get my way, that, you know, you've already lost. So... That's how you honor one another. That's how you have a Christian fight. And the apostle also adds something else. He says, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. That's worth thinking about. If you're a husband, consider this thought. God listens to me about as much as I listen to my wife. And God does for me about as much as I do for my wife. Is that, the, is that the ground rules you want to play by? Those are the ground rules. Okay? That's what it means. It says, now, if you 
live in knowledge with your wife and you're paying attention to her and doing what's best for her, then the prayers are going to go well. If you don't listen to her, do you think God's going to listen to you? Do you think he should? Is there a bigger gap between you and your wife or between you and God? Well, actually, there's no gap between you and your wife because you're on the same level. There's a big gap between you and God. And if you think you're too important to listen to your wife, well, God's way too important to listen to you. So listen as God listens. Um, think again about this. Jesus died for your wife. That's what he did. How do you think he'll like it if you don't treat her well? He gave his blood. What have you done lately? Well, if you're, if you're loving her the way you ought, then you can expect your prayers to get through. If not, well, God's going to withhold his favor and his answers to your prayers until you get with the program. There, literally, there's a, in the Bible, there's sometimes a time not to pray. There's a time to just stop asking God for stuff and say, boy, I better, I better get right with him and write with some people around me before I head back into the prayer room. Because he's not going to listen to my prayers if I keep on behaving this way towards the person whom I'm meant to cherish more than anybody else. So those are um, God's instructions for being an attractive wife and an attentive husband. And then your overall design as Christian spouses isn't just that you live in uninterrupted bliss, though I hope you have lots of bliss and it doesn't get interrupted too often. But overall, your life is also meant to convey things about God. When you live as male and female, you're honoring the differences that God created between men and women rather than trying to pretend that God's creative differences don't matter or don't count. So you're dis displaying the Creator's design in your marriage. You're showing the love of Jesus. When one of you is submitting and serving, when the other one is sacrificing and serving, you remember Jesus with the towel, Jesus washing people's feet, Jesus giving his life. And when you treat each other that way, you're showing something of Jesus. When you have the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, the beauty of the inner self, then you are showing that the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. And therefore, it's not just a woman thing to have a gentle and quiet spirit or a beautiful inner self. It's a man thing, too, because the Holy Spirit comes into you to produce the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Holy Spirit's living in you. And so as husband and wife, as Christian spouses, you're displaying God. In the context, Peter is telling mainly a wife how to display Jesus to a husband to win him over. But he also does have advice for Christian husbands. And so I'm overall saying that he's saying Christian spouses are meant to be displays of the reality of Jesus and of the truth of the gospel by the way they relate in their marriage. That's a sobering message. If people get their impression of Jesus from the way you regard each other and treat each other as Christian spouses, what do they think of him? Is it a good message or a bad one? And so we're, we're to live as Christian spouses to attract others to God. If you're a Christian wife and your husband isn't, attract him to God. If there are friends whom you know and your marriage is flourishing in the Holy Spirit and in the love of Jesus and in the creative goodness of God the Father, then your marriage is going to make a relationship with God more attractive to other people. And just a word about children. Peter doesn't say anything about bringing up children the way some of the other epistles do. But I will just say this. Peter already told you the most important thing about bringing up your children and leading them to the Lord. Love your spouse. If you do that, that's the single best piece of child-rearing advice that exists. Love your spouse, have a stable marriage that flourishes, and you'll be winning your kids over without words a great deal of the time. Uh, if there's constant tension, if there's a butting of heads and selfishness between husband and wife, then that tends more to push kids away from God rather than to win them towards him. Now, that doesn't mean that if you have a child who's wandered far, you right away say, oh, that was our bad marriage that did all that. Uh, you have to be very careful about just drawing these simple lines. But on the other hand, it's here. If you want to attract people to God as a Christian spouse, you can win a spouse towards him. 
And your marriage, if you're both united in the Lord, is going to attract your children to Jesus. It's going to attract your associates and friends to Jesus, your neighbors who know you. Your life together is going to be one of the best, or worst, uh, ways of conveying what faith in Jesus is really worth. So I encourage you again today to, to take to heart God's message. Wives, um, win your husbands over without words by the purity and reverence of your lives and focus on the beauty of the inner self. Husbands, uh, be ready to give anything for your wife, to defend her as the weaker partner and let your strength build her up and to do all that you can to help her flourish. And then you'll be a witness for Christ. And, and remember the overall section is, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires that war against your souls. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your good lives and glorify God on the day he visits us. That's been the overall command for which all of these other commands were designed. How you deal with the government. How you deal with um, employment and work. How you deal with marriage. It's all intended so that the way you live in a pagan world shines. And that many more are drawn to Christ and glorify him on that day when he comes again. So may God give us the grace to do just that. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for the blessing of marriage. We thank you for the way you designed it and how you've intervened in your redemption to restore and renew marriage again. And we pray, Lord, that our lives and our marriages will be emblems of your truth and of your reality and your love. Forgive us, Lord, when they're less than that. Forgive us, Lord, when they're far short of that and where some of us, Lord, need your change, your transformation, repentance and healing. Bring that about. And Lord, help all of us. Um, many of us, Lord, are, are not married. Some are uh, younger and, and maybe look forward to marriage. Help them to be instructed by these words. Some, Lord, are living as adult singles and have wonderful purposes in, in your communion. And help us, Lord, as a larger community to encourage one another. Where uh, married folks encourage the singles and singles build up and encourage those who are married and strengthen their family lives. And may all of us together, Lord, flourish as a community and shine so that those who are far from you will be drawn to the light of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.